So our next plenary talk will be given by Dr. Magda Carr of the Newcastle University. Dr. Carr is a senior lecturer in applied mathematics and the director of the business and engagement at Newcastle University. Her research interests span the areas of internal solitary waves, thermal convention in porous fluid layers, and geophysical fluid dynamics. She will be giving a talk today titled Mathematical and Experimental Modeling of Internal Solitary Waves. Dr. Carr, we're really excited to have you here. Take it away. Uh, thank you very much, Stavros. I'll just share my screen. So, let me see. Okay, so Stavros, can you just confirm that you can see the full screen, please? I can confirm, yes. Thank you. Okay, so thanks again, Stavros. Um, I really appreciate the invitation to be here at the IMA's Early Career Mathematicians Conference. It's a pleasure to have, to have the opportunity to talk to you all, so thank you very much for having me. Um, as Stavros said, I'm going to be talking about modelling internal solitary waves. So this is work that I do as part of my job as a senior lecturer in applied mathematics at Newcastle University. So a quick overview, I'm going to start with a little bit of background motivation. So I'll explain exactly what internal solitary waves are and why we're interested in studying them. I'll then explain to you how we model them in a physical laboratory, a little bit about the numerical modeling side of things and some examples of where I've kind of done this combined effort of lab and numerical based modeling and what we've learned as a result of that. And then finally, I'm going to finish off with a couple of slides just to say a little bit about my career. So a bit about how I've got to where I am and also maybe more importantly or interestingly, why I've stayed in academia as well. So solitary waves were first discovered by John Scott Russell in 1834 on the Edinburgh to Glasgow Union Canal. And Russell was watching a horse that was towing a barge and the horse came to an abrupt halt. As it did, the barge set a surface solitary wave into motion. And Russell followed this wave on horseback. He followed it for over a mile before he lost it in the windings of the canal. And what he observed when he was following this wave was that it traveled a very large distance without any change of form. So he called it a great wave of translation and later showed that the speed of these waves depend on the amplitude. So the larger the wave, the faster it travels. And it's also been shown that if you get two of these waves and you collide them head on, or if you have an overtaken um, event, then the waves just pass through one another without any change in form, except for a slight phase shift. Okay, so hence they have this solitary type behavior. So I'm interested in internal solitary waves. So these are waves that we get within stably stratified fluids and they travel on density interfaces. Okay, so I'm not talking about surface dynamics here. I'm talking about within a stratified fluid column. So internal solitary waves and surface, wa surface solitary waves as well, in fact, um, they owe their existence to an exact balance between nonlinear wave steepening and linear wave dispersion. Amplitudes of internal solitary waves are typically much larger than the thickness of the interface that they travel on, and the amplitudes can actually be comparable with the fluid depth. So here I'm just pointing you to three review papers. So if anyone's interested in learning more about internal solitary waves, these annual review fluid mechan mechanics papers are really quite accessible and worth a look if you want to do a little bit of background reading. So internal solitary waves occur in many physical settings. So we get them in gaseous plasmas, liquid crystals, acoustics, optical fibers, etc. cetera. Um, I focus on geophysical flows and in particular, particular oceanic. So in a geophysical setting, we get them in coastal zones and river outflows, in estuaries, lakes, reservoirs, and fjords, and the oceans and marginal seas. And in the atmosphere, they give rise to something called the morning glory effect, which is really quite spectacular. There's a couple of observations here or pictures to illustrate that process. I don't have time to go into it, but again, if you're interested in learning more, quick Google search of that, I'll show you some really nice information. Um, I'm going to concentrate on oceanic internal solitary waves. So I just want to say a little bit about how our oceans are stratified, first of all. So here you're looking at a graphic which shows depth against density. And these different plots are measurements that were taken in the Andaman Sea and the Sulu Sea. And you can see that we have 
what's called a stably stratified water column because of the dense fluid is sitting below less dense fluid. You can also see that the deep waters are very well mixed and we also get near surface waters that can be well mixed as well. Okay, so typically what happens in the ocean is that the deep waters tend to be saltier and colder than the near surface waters and hence they're more dense. Think about what happens at the surface. We have the sun heats the surface of the ocean. That causes the fluid to warm. Salt also evaporates off. We also have um, rainfall going into the ocean. So we have freshwater input and we have rivers running into the ocean off the land. Okay, so the near surface waters tend to be warmer and fresher. So typically what we get is a well mixed upper region of fluid, a well mixed lower region of fluid. And between the two, we have a region where the density changes relatively quickly with depth. Okay, so I'm going to refer to this region here as the picnocline. And you can think of that as just being an interface between two fluids of different densities. Now that interface can support internal wave motion in the same way as the interface between air and water supports surface wave motion. Um, the properties of internal waves, however, are very different to surface waves. So here's just some numbers to give you an idea of kind of the scale of these things. So they typically travel with speeds of the order 0.1 to 1 meter per second. Wave fronts are tens to hundreds of kilometers. Wave lengths are typically 0.1 to 1 kilometer and amplitudes are tens to hundreds of meters. Okay, so if we um, take the South China Sea as an example, first of all, it's a real hotbed for internal wave activity. They're, up, they're routinely observed there with amplitudes of 120 meters in fluid depths of just 340. Um, off Northwest, Aust Northwest Australia, there's been amplitudes observed of um, 80 meters in fluid depths of just 124. And the kind of latest observation from the South China Sea, I think this is probably the world record at the minute, the biggest amplitude wave that's been recorded is 240 meters in amplitude. And just to kind of put this in context, let's think about this in terms of scale. This conference, I believe, was meant to be held in Edinburgh, but unfortunately, due to COVID, we're all online, but I thought I'd use an image from Edinburgh. So this is a picture of the fourth bridge that stands at 100 meters tall. Back here, we've got the fourth row bridge, which is 150 meters. So the amplitude of an internal wave in our ocean is of this kind of size, right? It's as big as the bridge or even maybe twice as big. So these are really, really big structures within our oceans. They um, tend to travel as rank ordered wave packets. So this little schematic shows you an example of that. So they self-organize. So basically the leading wave um, has the biggest amplitude. Then the second wave behind it has the second largest amplitude and so on. And that's because these waves have this property that the bigger the amplitude, the faster the travel. So the biggest one is always at the front. They do travel in these packets and we observe them in these packets, but if we were able to let this go for an infinite amount of time, this front wave would just get away from the one behind it and so on. Okay, so as the picnocline is disturbed by an internal wave, it induces a current at the surface and that can give rise to regions of rough and slack water. So we get convergence and divergence in the velocity field. And if the climatic conditions are right, okay, so if there's not a lot of wind, if it's nice and calm and the sun's just at the right um, angle, this can be picked up using satellite and radar imagery. So here are some examples that I've taken from NASA's website. So these are satellite images that you're looking at. The first one is um, the Lombok Strait, just off the coast of Indonesia. The second is the South China Sea, and the third is the Strait of Gibraltar. And in all of these images, if you look carefully, I'm sure you can see this, we see these kind of bands. So we see these light and dark patches here and here and down here. So what we're looking at here it is a surface disturbance, but it's due to the internal wave motion that's going on subsurface. So how are these waves generated? Well, internal solitary waves were first discovered by Fjordov Nansen in 1893. He was a Norwegian polar explorer. And what he observed as he sailed his ship up a fjord, um, fjords are highly stratified, okay, so they typically have a lot of fresh water running off the land and they're connected to the sea, so there's a, a strong stratification in a fjord. And what Nansen observed when he came back from sea up a fjord was something that he called the dead water effect. So his boat slowed down as a result of coming into the fjord. And 
it was shown that this slowing down effect, this drag effect, is because the ship's hull is actually disturbing the picnic line. And as it disturbs the picnic line, it generates an internal wave field. And the energy it loses to doing that is felt as a drag effect on the boat. Okay, so that's one way that can be generated. But more commonly across the oceans, they tend to be generated if you have a tidal current passing over topography. So if you imagine if you have a sill or a seamount, and as your picnic line kind of washes up and down over that, that can then generate an internal, internal wave field on the picnic line. They can also be generate, generated by the wind. So if you have a strong wind at the surface of the ocean, you get what's called a downwelling event, and the picnic line gets pushed down. Then when the wind relaxes, the picnic line relaxes as well. And again, that can generate an internal wave field. Um, they can also be caused by gravity currents. So this is an example of a gravity current intrusion here. So here we're looking at a SAR image and we've got a river mouth. So we've got fresh water coming out of the river. It forms this buoyant plume of fresh water. However, if that buoyant plume of fresh water extends deep enough that it can disturb the picnic line, then it can generate internal waves. And we see that in this image here, in this image by the surface signature of the internal wave field, which has been generated and is now propagating offshore in this case. Okay, so there's many gen different generating mechanisms. These waves are obviously of concern to the offshore engineering community who want to know what kind of impact loads they have on cables, rigs and risers. They can also um, cause scour on pipelines and they can tel tilt helipads on um, oil rigs even after anchor tension has been increased to try and withstand the impact from the internal wave field. So there's some real engineering applications there. They're also of interest to submariners, okay, because um, internal waves can distort underwater communications. So I'll show you some some images later on where we see the water column getting well mixed by an internal wave so that can interfere with kind of sonar communication and there are reports that submarines can actually go along behind internal waves undetected because of this they can also cause hazards or pose a hazard or a threat to submarines so this picture is of USS Thresher and um, it unfortunately sank it was in the early 60s and everyone on board lost their lives Still not clear exactly what happened, but internal waves have been cited as a possible source of that accident. Um, from a physical oceanographic perspective, these waves are of fundamental interest because they're a source of momentum and mixing within our oceans. They can transport heat and nutrients vertically. They can resuspend sedimentary material and also transport mass over very large distances. Okay, so lots of motivation there lots of good reasons to study these waves let me now explain what kind of contribution we make on the modeling front so if i can first of all tell you how we generate an internal solid wave in the laboratory so at newcastle university i've got a wave flume it is seven meters long 0.4 meters wide and 0.6 meters deep and the first thing we do is to mix up in this reservoir that's beneath the tank mix up a big batch of salt water okay so we just put mains water in there we dissolve a load of salt into it and we then pump that into the main tank so that gives us our bottom layer in the stratification so let's just assume that has some density row three and that the fluid has a depth h3 okay so it's the relatively deep layer and it's the salty layer then above the flume we have two more reservoirs and in these reservoirs we put fresher fluid. So sometimes it might just be straightforward fresh water, or it could be brine solution again, but a smaller density than what's in that bottom layer. But we then take this fresher fluid or this less dense fluid and we gravity feed it into the main flume through an array of sponges. Okay, so this is the lab where I worked as a postdoc in Dundee. And this just shows you what these sponges look like. So we have an array of them and we fill through them from these reservoirs above using gravity. And that gives rise to a stratification. Okay, so we do it nice and slowly. We end up with a layer of fresh fluid on the top and we get a picnic line or an interface between those two layers. So once the tank's stratified, we then put a gate in the upstream end of the tank. And behind this gate, we fill with fluid which has come from these top buckets. So it's the same density as what we have in the top layer of the main 
uh, section of the tank. Okay, so behind the gate, we put fluid of density row one, and this density matches the density in the top layer in the main section. So now if you take a look across this gate, you can see that there's a density gradient. Okay, so we've got um, light fluid on the left-hand side, heavy fluid on the right-hand side. So when we pull the gate out, this fresher fluid wants to sit up here somewhere. Okay, so it rises, this heavier stuff falls, and we cause a disturbance to the picnocline, which propagates into the main section of the tank as an internal solitary wave of depression. Now, by carefully controlling the shape and size of what we put behind this gate, we can control what we get out here. So to visualize the flow, we um, seed the water column with neutrally buoyant light reflecting tracer particles, and we illuminate from below. So the base of the tank is transparent, and underneath the tank we have some light boxes. They just generate a thin continuous light sheet, which we put in the main section of the tank, and then we view from the side. Okay, so we're going to be looking at a two-dimensional slice of the flow field. The particles are neutrally buoyant, so they're representative, they're representative of where the flow moves. So we can use something called particle image filler symmetry, or PIV, to compute the velocity field. And the way that works is we have an image, we essentially have white dots on a, back, on a black background, and we use this software package to take an image in our experimental movie. We then look at the next image in the sequence, and the software uses a, a cross-correlation pattern matching technique to try to identify where a particle goes from one frame to the next. That then gives us, gives us the displacement of a particle, and because we know the time interval between frames, we can then infer the velocity field, or rather compute the velocity field. And to measure density, we have conductivity sensors. So sitting above the tank, we have these sensors. They pass an electric current, and when we put them down through our water column, the electrical um, conductivity changes with salinity. Okay, so as you change the salinity, the conductivity reading changes, and hence we can infer the density field. Okay, so if I can now show you a movie from the lab. So I can just play this and pause it for a second. So let me explain what you're looking at. So you, we're, we're viewing this in a false color scheme. So you'd normally just see black and white. So you normally have white dots on a black background. This false color scheme just shows things um, in reds and yellows and greens. Sometimes we can see a little bit more. So this lower layer is the salty layer of fluid. Here we've got fresh water. And this region where we get the congregation of particles is basically the pigment claim. And these are just those conductivity probes I mentioned, okay? And the top of the water column is just out of our field of view, just up here somewhere. If I play this, you're going to see a large amplitude, internal solitary wave of depression. You can see it goes unstable. And we're taking conductivity readings through those billows on the tail of the wave. So I'm just going to play that for it you again and I just want you to watch and see if you can work out why that wave is breaking. So just have a look at how the fluid moves and see if you think you know what's causing the wave to go unstable. Okay so if I can just pause it at that point and let's have a look at this together. So if you look at the fluid in the top of the water column, okay or rather in the top layer, the fluid above the interface is traveling in the same direction as the wave whereas the fluid below is going in the opposite direction. So if you think about what's going on here across that interface, we've got two fluids going in opposite directions and we basically have a shear. Okay, so there's a strong shear force there. And if that shear is strong enough, then these waves break and we get these beautiful billows rolling up on the tail of the wave. They're called Kelvin Helmholtz billows and they're a result of shear instability. Okay, and then we were trying to get an idea of what the overturner looked like within those billows using the conductivity probes. So I now just want to run you through how we model this numerically. Okay, now I appreciate that the audience we have is very broad today. Um, so my explanation is going to be somewhat hand wavy and more conceptual rather than detailed. Okay, so I'm going to really skip the details and just try and explain roughly what's going on here. So First of all, we're going to assume that our fluid is inviscid. 
Okay, so we're going to neglect viscosity. We're basically throwing out friction. We're also going to assume that we have an incompressible flow. So we're just saying we can't squash the fluid. In other words, the density does not change with pressure. And we're going to assume that we have the Boussinesque approximation, which just says, let's ignore changes in density in all terms, except those that are multiplied by gravity. And we're also going to restrict attention to two dimensions. Okay, so the first equation you see here, this is known as Euler's equation, and it just represents conservation of momentum. So it's a bit like Newton's second law. It's the kind of force equals mass times acceleration analog for a fluid layer. It's not quite, okay, and, and I will mention another equation later on, but this just basically represents conservation of momentum. The second equation you see here represents conservation of mass, and the third is our incompressibility condition. So we can rewrite everything, or sorry, we can rewrite these equations in terms of vorticity. So vorticity is the curl of the velocity field. And in terms of buoyancy, where buoyancy is related to the density field, and our equations now look like this. Okay, so these look like two very simple equations, but actually they're not so easy to solve. Okay, now we can make some progress, and I'll just explain what we do, what we can do, first of all. So we can employ some weakly nonlinear theory. So this is Cordovec de Vries or KDV theory. And in this case, what we're going to say, we're going to assume that we can write our stream function. So this is just related to the velocity field. We're going to write the stream function as a waveform. So some function of X and T. So X is my horizontal direction and T is time multiplied by some vertical structure function. So I'm taking Y to be the vertical direction then you can show that this vertical structure function just has to satisfy this equation. This is a Helmholtz equation. And you can see we have dependence on this parameter n, which is buoyancy frequency squared, and that's related to the gradient of the density field, and c, where c is the wave speed. The waveform has to satisfy the KDV equation. This is the KDV equation here. You get this from expanding Euler's equation in terms of two small variables, a, the amplitude of the wave divided by the total fluid depth, and the total fluid depth divided by the length of the domain. And we assume that these two things are very small parameters. So if you assume these two things are small, then you can do an expansion, throw out higher order terms, fully nonlinear terms, and just do this, what we call a weakly nonlinear analysis, and you derive this equation. Now, what this equation actually says is that you must have a balance between nonlinear wave steepening and linear wave dispersion. So this term here is nonlinear in B, okay, because B appears twice. So we see this is a nonlinear term in B, and this is dispersion. Okay, so there's a balance between these two things. And if you remember right at the start, I said internal solitary waves owe their existence to this balance. Okay, so this describes internal solitary wave behavior. And you can show that a solution to this equation takes a set squared form. Okay, so that's all well and good and does a really good job, but we assumed that we had a small amplitude. Now, of course, we've, we've seen, or I've already shown you the numbers at the start, that in the ocean, these waves can be very large. And in the lab, to get these waves to break, I found that I really had to push the amplitude high. So we want something that describes large amplitude waves. Okay, now, we can't do anything exact or analytical for that. Um, for the fully nonlinear theory, we need to do something numerical. In other words, we're gonna look for an approximate solution and we're gonna use numerical analysis and computation to get that. Basically what we do in our numerics is, the key part to it is we know from the weekly nonlinear theory what an exact solution looks like and we know that that does a really good job at small amplitudes. So we say, for small amplitudes, let's start with an initial guess based on KDV theory. And then numerically what we do is we increment the amplitude in a very, very slowly and in very small steps. And we use something called linear extrapolation on previous values of interest that we got from KDV theory. And we just continue in that way. Okay, so we do this numerically. We step, we step up really gently, but we start with an initial guess that we know is very good for small amplitudes. So in this way, we can sweep out our domain and get some wave solutions that represent fully nonlinear theory for large amplitude. 
All of this is time independent. So to see how these evolve, we need a so-called evolution solver. So we have a solver for these two equations. Again, I'm not gonna go through these details if people are interested, they can look up the relevant paper. So we have a time dependent code that we can put these um, fully nonlinear large amplitude waves into and then just let the code go with time. And here's what we find. Okay, so the top plot there is just an image from the lab and the bottom two are images from the numerics. And I just flashed this up because I just want to show you qualitatively that the numerics is doing a really good job of capturing the main dynamics that we saw in the laboratory. We also find actually if we look a quantitative measure. So if we look at things, there's something called the Thorpe scale that um, measures the overturning in these billows. We did that numerically and also in the lab and we got excellent agreement between the two. Um, why do we do this? Why take two approaches? Well, what the lab's really good at is giving you physical insight. So you get a really good idea about what's going on physically. However, it's limited in terms of what we can measure. So we can measure the velocity field, but whenever the flow where the flow goes blurry. So if you have a lot of mixing, then these little particles go out of focus and you lose information. So you can't measure the velocity field everywhere. And also these density probes just give you a snapshot, right? They just give you a vertical profile and a snapshot in time. Whereas the numerical computations, they give us measures in the full field. Okay, so we can get the full velocity field, we can get the full density field, and we can also get other theoretical parameters out. Okay, so we can compute basically whatever we like, provided we can write it down mathematically. And that gives us more theoretical insight into what's going on. So it's this kind of marrying up of the physical insight and the theoretical insight, which can be quite powerful. And the other advantage, of course, of the numerics is that we're not restricted in the same way in terms of horizontal scale, if you like. So we've got a flume and it's only a certain length long. We can't make it any longer. But in the numerics, it's relatively easier to change your domain size. Okay, so we can make a lot of progress with these modeling studies. Of course, they're idealized and they're very different to what we, to, to the ocean in terms of the, some of the assumptions we make and the idealization. Um, but here's an observation that was made by Jim Moon and others in 2003. This is the, an observation of an internal solitary wave on the Oregon continental shelf. You're looking at um, an acoustic image. And um, we have an internal wave going from left to right. So here you can see how the pit has been disturbed. And look at this, these beautiful billows, these overturning billows. At the time, the authors hypothesized that these were due to shear and that they thought these were KH billows, but they weren't able to show it or prove it. So hopefully our modeling studies have kind of helped in that respect to back up the kind of hypothesis that was put forward in that paper. Okay, so it's really nice if we can kind of do a combination of lab modeling, numerical modeling and field modeling to try and understand what's going on. So I just want to show you quickly another kind of perspective. So one of the first experiments I ever did in the lab was to try and measure the boundary layer flow beneath an internal solitary wave. So I just want you to concentrate on the flow at the bottom boundary now. So you can see it's accelerated in the negative x direction by the wave. And then as the wave goes past, it decelerates and slows down. And if you look very closely, can you see, you should hopefully be able to see a flow reversal so this little boundary layer jet going right along the bottom of the tank. Okay, so interesting. We weren't expecting to see that, but we did these experiments, saw this feature, and then of course we had to explain what was, what was happening and what was going on. We actually were able to show theoretically that that formation of that jet along the bottom was due to the boundary layer separating in the adverse pressure gradient region. And there was some other literature which kind of qualified that as well. Um, and I want to show you what happens if we increase the flow speed and we zoom right in on the bed. So in these two movies, the top one is output from the PIV, the bottom's in the lab, but we're zoomed right in. We're pushing the fluid velocity. So there goes the jet. You can see it quite nicely in the vectors in the top movie, and we see the jet in the bottom. But also now, if you look closely, forming at the top of that jet are these vortices. You can see that they're resuspending particles off the bed and they're being shed upward into the water column. Okay, so we've done quite a bit in this area and that was worked out quite neat as well. It's quite nice because around the same time this field observation came up. So this was made by Quaresma et al in 2007 on the Western Portuguese mid-shelf. 
The colour scheme here at the top is temperature, so you can see how the thermocline was being disturbed by an internal solitary wave train. We've got eco intensity at the bottom, and you can see that there's this turbulence going on in the bottom layer. So it looks like there's some resuspension of particles. Um, obviously, there's differences between this and what we've seen in the lab, but we think that kind of fundamental features we're seeing in the lab and that we've explained from a kind of classical fluid mechanics point of view are at play here in the field. There's still a lot of work to do, especially when it comes to putting sediment into the problem, but that's an ongoing area of research. Okay, and the last kind of example I want to show you is just what happens if you have what's called a mode two wave and it shows on a slope. So again, at the bottom, we're looking at a lab movie. This image at the top is output from the PIV, so the measured um, fluid velocity and the color scheme is vorticity. So you're gonna see in mode two wave. So this is a, a bulge of fluid. So we've got in mode one waves, you just get isopycnals going in one direction. Here we get them going in two. And this is what happens as this mode two wave shows. You can see it develops a tail. And um, there's quite a bit of buildup in vorticity signal at that lower boundary. And you can see the wave starts to split in some sense. The bottom gets flattened and left behind the top, which splits into two parts. Now, what we're not able to see in the lab is what happens when this picnic line intersects the bottom slope. OK, so in this shallow slope case, the lab was just not long enough to see it. So we decided to do some numerical modelling to see what happens in the terminal phase of shoaling. The numerical model this time, however, does need to take account of viscosity. So this time we used a Navier-Stokes solver. So before we had Euler's equation, which were these terms here, if we now add in um, a so-called viscous term, we recover what's known as Navier-Stokes equation. And I used a code that's been developed by Kevin Lamb and Marek Statzner over the years. And we've had lots of success in applying their code to our lab. And I'm just going to show you some results from that now. So on the left hand side, you see output from the lab. On the right hand side is the numerical simulation. You can see the agreement between the two is really quite excellent. But what we can get from the numerics is a lot more than what we can get from the lab alone. So in these plots here, this kind of black fluid that you see is set at the average density of the water column. And we can really see what happens to that fluid once it enters the core and comes out the back. Also, if we look at the vorticity plots, you can see there's a lot more detail in them than what we're measuring in the lab. And of course, numerically, we can extend that domain and look at what happens when the picnic line intersects the slope and see what happens to these waves as they shoal. Okay, and you can see what's happening here is that the wave essentially degenerates down into mode one waves of elevation. So the breakdown lowers the mechanical energy density and this wave train effectively runs out of stream. It's basically destroyed by the interaction and there's no reflected wave signal. We did look at different slope, slope steepnesses um, uh, in this work here, but I just wanted to point out this one because it's a very gentle slope. Okay, so in the field, slopes are typically very gentle and we're quite interested in, you know, what might be going on in the field, internal waves dissipate their energy. And we think this may be one way of dissipating energy when they show they're effectively destroyed by the process. But that's yet to be confirmed from field work and observations. Okay, so that's hopefully given you a little idea of some of the things I've been working on. In addition, we've looked at what happens if you have a sill at the bottom. So if you have a seamount, how do the waves interact with sills? And we've also been looking at what happens if you have ice at the top. So what's going on in the Arctic at the minute? So if you have an internal wave that interacts with some sea ice, how do the dynamics change? So I did a set of experiments in this cold lab facility out in Germany. So we actually chilled the lab right down and made real ice on the top here, which was really neat. We had to work in hats and gloves and things. It was quite a challenge from a practical point of view, but um, that was a really nice project. Unfortunately, you don't have time to, to say much more other than that, because I just want to very quickly finish off by saying a little bit about my career and kind of how I got to where I am. So I started off by doing a a maths degree at Durham University a few years back now. Um, the reason I chose maths, I think first and foremost, was because I enjoyed it. So I certainly really enjoyed doing A-level mathematics and especially applied maths. I think, you know, kind of earlier on in my school education, I wasn't too fussed about maths, but I really enjoyed A-level. So one thing was I certainly enjoyed doing mathematics. 
The reason I went to Durham is because um, Newcastle United used to train there. So back in these days, we had a really good team. Kevin Keegan was the manager and um, Newcastle trained on the university sports ground. So I thought, I'll be great. I'll just, you know, I can go watch Newcastle training all the time. Didn't realise I would have a, a big timetable and lots of, lots of lectures to attend. So I actually didn't get to see them a lot. But my main decision to go there was a love of maths and because Newcastle trained there. I uh, did a four year degree. I must admit, by the end of it, I just I couldn't wait to leave. I was quite happy to leave academia, get a job in the real world. You know, I kind of was fed up of doing exams uh, by that stage, I think. So I became, I joined um, Via Systems Limited, who were a, a printed circuit board factory. I got a graduate job as an industrial engineer. So they said, you know, we need highly talented mass graduates who can do capacity modeling and improve productivity. Um, sounded great, but in reality, I was stood on a shop floor with a, a clipboard and a stopwatch and I used to have to time people working and I had to put all these numbers into a big Excel spreadsheet and see how many units they should be making a week. And then um, that was the level of the maths. And I think when I did that job, even though it was a really bad job and I hated it, it was actually a really good experience because it taught me so much. It, what I really learned was that um, I loved learning and I hadn't appreciated it until that point. I think, you know, you go through school and you go through university and you just learn to pass exams. And the more material you get thrown at you, just the, the more work it is. So I didn't actually think that I enjoyed learning. But as soon as I stopped learning, I quickly realised that I did. And uh, I decided to go back to university because I, I missed learning so much. I didn't want that to kind of be the end. I was also very fortunate in that one of my old lecturers, Dr Vernon Armitage, had kept in touch with me. And he'd got in touch and said, you know, how, how's your job going? And I'd said, you know, I really don't like it. I don't know what to do. And he said, well, look, why don't you come back to Durham and do a PhD? And I kind of said, oh, a PhD what? I didn't even know what one was. So if it hadn't been for someone like him, I probably would have been a lot more clueless than what I was. And he encouraged me back and I came back to Durham and I did a PhD. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed that. It was a completely different learning experience to doing a degree. Um, I think the beauty of a PhD is you can only go as fast as you can learn. So you're very much in charge of your learning. I did that with Brian Strawn, who was a real pleasure to work with. He was a fantastic supervisor. And we worked on modeling convection currents in fluid and porous media. So I um, thoroughly enjoyed that. Uh, another little football connection. So when I was an undergraduate, I played football at university. And I really missed that in this year out. So it was another reason to go back to university because I miss learning. I also miss playing football. So that was a fantastic three years in Durham with Brian. After my PhD, I moved to Dundee as a PDRA. I was working with Peter Davies in Dundee. And that's where I was introduced to lab work on internal solitary waves. So I hadn't done any lab work at that point. So my PhD was computational, it was numerical. Uh, the lab work was completely new experience, but that was one of the attractions for me. The other attraction was when I met Peter for my interview, I, you know, I just really liked him, hit it off with him straight away. He also had a picture of his son on his desk, dressed in a Newcastle strip. So we got talking about that. Turns out he was a Newcastle fan as well. And the interview quickly turned to questions like, who would you play at left back on Saturday? And who was your favourite goal scorer of all time? So I knew instantly there was a connection there and I really enjoyed Peter's company. And that turned into a fantastic collaboration. We still work together to this day. We also played football together for a while. Um, after the postdoc, I got a position as a lecturer and then a senior lecturer at St Andrews, which was very fortunate because of its proximity to Dundee, it meant I was still able to get access to the lab. And like I say, keep this nice collaboration going with Peter. And then more recently, I've returned back to the Northeast of England and I'm now in Newcastle. So to summarise, how have I got to all these places? I have to admit, I think I've just fallen into a lot of it. Yes, there was a love of maths there. Football has played big decisions where I've gone and why, which is completely bizarre. Nothing to do with maths or the people or the places, but, you know, part of my life. But the biggest influence on me um, and the reason I am where I am, as I have to say, is people. OK, so Dr Armitage in those early days, Brian has been my PhD supervisor and Peter as my postdoctoral supervisor were all fantastic mentors okay and I've been very fortunate to have had them help me guide me I've had great work and relationships with them and they've really kind of pushed me to the places I am today so advice I'll give to you all is when you go for interviews different places and when you're considering what you might want out of a career 
really think about the people you're going to be working with, really think about whether that relationship's going to be a good one and choose people that you like, choose people that you get on with, choose people that you think you're going to, you know, enjoy being in their company. And it's, it makes such, such a difference. And I think I've been very fortunate in all the people I've worked with. I've really hit on with that. Okay. So finally, why have I stayed in academia? Well, or why do I enjoy doing this work? So the biggest attraction for me is the research. So the research is obviously original. Okay. So by definition, it has to be original. So that means you're the only person working on it. Okay. And that, that is really exciting. So this idea of discovery and being the only person in the world that is probably working on that exact specific thing is, is just mind blowing. Really this kind of discovery science is really nice. It means that you're doing very highly specialized work and original work and you can claim to be in a world expert in what you do because you're the only person in the world doing it right so you can say you're a world expert in what you do um moreover you get to travel the world because of that okay so people want to hear about what you're doing and you get fantastic opportunities to travel so again with peter i was very fortunate he sent me all over the world when i was a postdoc i probably didn't appreciate it at the time i was quite intimidated by it didn't particularly enjoy it and it's only with hindsight and when I look back, I realise just how fortunate I've been. So in red here are all the places I've managed to get to with work. But more than that, it's the people I've met. So while I say at the start, it was quite intimidating and I didn't particularly enjoy going to conferences, having to speak to people that I didn't know and just introduce yourself. And, you know, they just seem so intelligent and on a completely different level. These same people... I'm still meeting today and when I go to conferences now it's just like a reunion it's a fantastic social event and it's really nice to catch up with people and hear what they're up to and share ideas and share knowledge and it's I think we're very privileged as academics to be able to work like that and finally I think the job is very varied okay so I don't just do research I also teach which I really enjoy as well I think the best way to learn something is to teach it and I have to do a bit of admin so I won't pretend I enjoy admin I don't mind doing it but it means your job is very varied. No two days are the same and there's always plenty to keep you busy. And it's very flexible as well. Okay, so you're your own boss. I mean, that there's pros and cons to that. You do have to be very self-motivated, but with it comes a, a lot of flexibility. So it's not like a nine to five job. You can pick and choose essentially what you do and when, and that can have a lot of benefits as well. So I will pause there. Thank you very much for your time and for listening. And I'll hand back to Stavros. Thank you very much, Dr. Carr. I must admit the presentation was very interesting, both the technical part and career trajectory information advice.